Okay, hello and welcome to today's dialogue webinar, which is all about uh, getting data and code from various sources into the workspace. So this is actually a continuation of a previous webinar uh, in which I introduced the various new user commands, uh, view, apple cart, names, and repper, which are included in installations of Dialog version 18.2. Um, but as I mentioned at the end of that, there is also this experimental user command called get, but it does quite a lot or it, it's relatively involved. So we thought it deserved its own treatment. So that's what this is today. Uh, if you're watching live on Dialogue TV, uh, please bear with me as I go through uh, the stuff I'm going to present here and then I will try to check the chat afterwards, see if there are any questions that I don't think were covered. So without further ado, there are uh, many different formats and sources of code and data um, that you might want to bring into the workspace. You know, it comes could come from various different locations, even more than are than are listed here. Uh, these are the ones that that just pertain to the get user command, um, and there are also a multitude of formats. So as a result of that, in Dialog we provide a range of different functions. A lot of them, as you can see here, are quad something system functions. Uh, and some other API functions in order to do things. So some of these are simply for uh, importing stuff into the workspace, typically some, some kind of raw data or some text data or something. Um, some of them are for processing that data and bring it, bring in, bringing it into a format that is some kind of sensible APL representation that can be used. Uh, and a couple, as you can see here, the examples for today are quad fix and quad CSV, they can actually do both. So while you know they sort of principally uh, process data to bring it in, quad fix for uh, APL code and quad CSV for, for tabular data, typically, um, they can also read directly from files. So to start with, I'm going to cover uh, the main sort of syntax and features of what get is, uh, and then we'll look at a few examples and some of the syntax for uh, the underlying functions, uh, which can then be used uh, a bit more specifically. So you'll see what I mean in a second, you know. So the point being, there are lots of different uh, types of data and even formats of, of code currently that you might want to bring into the workspace. There are lots of different ways to do this. What GET provides is a kind of unified uh, one-stop shop interface for, well, as it says here, getting pretty much anything uh, from pretty much anywhere, or at least a lot of uh, common things that you might want to do. So in particular, it's this user command and it does a little bit of uh, logic and guesswork to try and figure out what's a sensible way of bringing the data in and what's a sensible format to convert that to once it's in the workspace. And as a result of that, um, your results actually may vary, you know, depending on the exact format of your source data or your source code. So we very much recommend you do not use this uh, at runtime as part of your application, this is very much a development time tool uh, as the exact results may vary. And that's also why I'm going to cover uh, some of the underlying functions that you can use uh, in code because they have much more strictly defined uh, functions and you can do things like error handling with them uh, and be a bit more certain about what, what the results are going to be. 
The syntax itself is pretty simple. You're going to do right bracket get and then something. And that something is going to be, you know, some description of the source of the thing we want to get. And uh, as, as a sort of result or side effect of doing it, it will define, you know, at least this one name typically, um, which is the something that you're trying to get. And it will print out the uh, namespace path of that something that is defined, or it could be multiple things, as we'll see. So yeah, as I was alluding to, it's you know it's a development time tool to try and quickly get things into the workspace, and it uses some kind of heuristics uh, often to figure out what it should do. So simple examples include you know for APL code, uh, it'll search the WUS path, try to see if the name that you're asking for is is somewhere in there. So you can get the Defens workspace into your active workspace, and that will be as a namespace called Defens, uh, wherever you are, so in, in the current namespace. Or if it doesn't find it there, it'll look in places like the salt CMD deer or the work deer, so the salt paths, uh, see if there's a, a matching name there, and bring that source code in. So the uh, previous or traditional equivalent that you might use for HTTP command is uh, right bracket load, get works with this as well. Or if it doesn't find in those places, then it'll look for the source files uh, in a directory relative to the current directory, which you can find with bracket CD, where you currently are, uh, or you could provide a more specified path than this. So, uh, those are sort of basic things for common sources of APL code, um, but also if you provide the name of a file, so in this case it's a .aplf link style uh, dialog APL function text file, then it'll bring that in, in this case, and just define a function in the current namespace. Uh, link also uses the APL array notation, so you can have APL arrays defined in plain text in that format and get those. And it even supports other things like the acre type source files, I suppose dado now probably using that and dot carmat is basically a, a plain text file that describes a character matrix, right? And each new line in that file is a row in the matrix, uh, but get will bring that in as a simple character matrix. And then beyond APL uh, format things, it also does some common data format conversions. So popular ones include JSON, JavaScript object notation, um, not just the strict JSON defined JSON, we'll see examples later when we look uh, under the hood a bit, uh, but also uh, JSON5, which is also kind of valid JavaScript. So it's a definition or it's a, a way of writing, you know, uh, definitions of JSON objects that's less strict, I suppose, in a sense than, than, than just JSON. Um, and if you executed it in a, in a JavaScript console, then it would, uh, it could be used to define that object in JavaScript. But with get, we'll get a APL JSON object. Uh, defined in the workspace. And that's also the format that's used in the new dialog configuration files, so .dcfg. So it could be convenient for bringing in and inspecting those sorts of things. Then other popular ones include uh, comma separated values for tabular data or XML for you know different uh, nested data structures that have been serialized and, and transmitted some way or another, or you've downloaded a file or something. So all those examples were from sort of local sources, local files on your machine, uh, but get can also be used to 
retrieve stuff from the internet. So in this example, we're pointing to a web page. What we'll get back is just a simple character vector of the uh, HTML source of that web page. Alternatively, if you point to a GitHub URL, uh, it will try to interpret that, assuming it's a repository of some APL source code, like a project or something. Uh, and it will download that as a zip file, unzip it in a temporary directory. And then if it finds APL source files within, it will define those in your workspace uh, in a namespace named after the repository name. So in this case, uh, the Abrids KBD repository, you know, it mostly contains, uh, I think it's text files and other types of files that define various keyboard layouts. But there are a couple of utility functions that happen to be APL functions, and those are what get defined in this case in your workspace. So they're APL functions within the namespace hash.kbd here. No, nope. yeah, okay. And, you know, if you see HTTPS colon slash slash, uh, then you might guess, so, well, does it support other protocols? Well, at least FTP for now. Uh, to get things from an FTP server. Not exactly sure if any others or what else. Um, but there is also a sort of a little bit of convenience here. Uh, if you know what you're looking for, you don't want to type as much. If you supply an argument that kind of looks like a URL, it will first attempt to interpret that as a HTTP sort of URL and get whatever it is from, from there. So as I alluded to with the GitHub examples, uh, get is able to unpack some stuff. So the first example of this is say, you know, you might be uh, delivered some APL source code, but it's instead of just a loose folder, it's actually a zip file. Get can unzip that and then uh, define the APL code within in your workspace, which is pretty convenient. Another quite nifty tool or feature of get is the ability to go within a repository and pick out some subfolder. So if you give the full path to some subdirectory and yeah, you could, uh, I guess, go through and click until you get the raw, raw.github.com URL and then just get the plain file and it'll try to interpret that, for example, if it is an APLF file. But if you're just using the, the regular GitHub interface, you click through to a subdirectory and you think, I just want this part of the repository, then you can provide that to get. Unpacking is, yeah, not just to do with the specific formats of files, but also where you've got some a uh, source of APL code, you only want some part of it, right? And for example, a common thing to do is copy specific functions out of the defense workspace. You can do that with the hyphen only modifier. And as usual with user commands, you can shorten this to just hyphen O. So in this case, getting a uh, delete extraneous blanks and delete all blanks, but those will still be defined inside a namespace that's named after you know the source description you gave so in this case it's a namespace defense containing just those two functions and you can see that if we do a little bracket map here but if you're just grabbing particular things from within you know for example some of the uh, workspaces shipped with dialog like defense, you might just want those utilities and not have to dot into the namespace. So you can also use the hyphen u or hyphen unpack modifier to uh, bring those names directly into the current namespace. And also maybe worth mentioning is if you do this initial 
get defense minus O with just the two names. If you want to then later bring a third name into that subname space, uh, you can't do it currently using this exact syntax because it tries not to just clobber and overwrite uh, existing namespaces. But what you can do is provide, uh, oh sorry, here's the map of what that looks like. You can provide a target namespace and then use unpack. So you could do get defens minus O equals PCO minus target. Did I say minus target is defens minus unpack? And you can add uh, extra functions in there. And you could get those from any source and then set the target to defens. Yeah, so that's another option that I think I'll mention in a second. Um, so that's yeah to do with unpacking bits of code or uh, sub pieces of repositories. There are some other options as well with get. So these are to do with helping you think you know use get for specific ways where you can uh, specifically ask for what what do you want get to try and do with the data because. Uh, by default, it will use these heuristics to try and guess or figure out what APL object should be defined in your workspace. But you might not want that. So in this example, we are looking at a .json file, which would define a JSON object. But if at the end of your uh, path, be it a URL or a relative file path, you put a colon and then an extension, this says, this asks get to treat the source as if it was, in this case, a text file or whatever the extension is. So instead of defining a JSON object, here we're just bringing in <coughs> the raw JSON as text. And as I was, uh, as I was mentioning a second ago, uh, you can also ask get to put this you know name or as I was mentioning before you could ask it to unpack some names like functions within defense and put them in a specified namespace so using the minus T or minus target modifier sort of mentioned a couple of times now, uh, link style folders that contain APL source files that could be, you know, a linkable namespace. But of course, link is designed to have this bi-directional link. If you give the hyphen S or hyphen sync modifier, then for a linkable namespace, then if you inspect the status, you'll see, uh, you know, it, it has linked the folder on the file system with the namespace in your active workspace. And there's the bidirection, there's the two arrows there indicating that both if you modify the code uh, on the APL side, then those changes will be updated on the file system. And if you have .NET av available, then vice versa. Uh, also, I think if you have, for example, a scripted namespace or another source file that can be established using two quad fix, then I think you can also get synchronization in that case. Although I might be wrong about that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but definitely linkable namespaces. Should check that. So, yeah, as you can imagine, okay, for most cases, most of the time, we hope that get will get you what you, you know, what you think you want or what you're asking for. Um, but of course, results may vary. And also, as mentioned, you shouldn't use this uh, in your application code, right? Because it's just a user command. But underneath, 
there are these API functions and quad functions that you can use. So now I'm going to have a very brief look at each of these, just the basic syntax and maybe an example or two. So they're not in a really particular order, but we'll start off with definitely <clears throat> uh, one of the most straightforward and simple ones. A lot of times you want to bring in some text data and then you'll do the code to interpret you know, the meaning and, and process it yourself afterwards. That's quad and get, it's very convenient usually, or sorry, the default behavior is to bring in a vector of characters or a, char a simple character vector, right? Quad end get actually returns uh, a three element vector result. The first is the content, and by default that's a character vector. The second is some metadata about the encoding that you almost never really <laughs> actually need, especially if you're just getting things into the workspace. And also for the third element, which is the uh, what the new line characters of the source file are. So whether they're line feed or uh, carriage return line feed or just carriage return. Um, but if you're just bringing text into the workspace, you basically never really need that, uh, in part because quad and get actually normalizes text files. So... <clears throat> Um, regardless of what the new line characters are in the source file, in the workspace you will have a simple character vector with line feed characters as new lines. So that's quad UCS 10. And also regardless of whether the source file has a trailing new line or not, uh, the character vector that's brought into the workspace will have a trailing new line. So it basically becomes a, a more a very regular uh, new line character delimited um, character vector and you know you could get quad UCS 10 and then split by delimiter uh, train and then the result of this if you wanted to split it from a character vector into a nested vector of a character vector for each new line but that's such a common pattern that you can actually simply provide the extra flag uh, put a number one after the file name and you'll get a vector of character vectors. Uh, that one by default is zero, that's why you don't have to include it normally for that flag. Alright, quad and get. Particularly, you know, if you've got a text file already on your system, but what if it's something from the internet you want to get? Well, there is HTTP command you can sort of use it straightforward through as like an API, use the methods kind of straightforwardly by loading the class and then simply calling the get method on a URL. Uh, do a little check of the response HTTP status. If it's 200, that means it's good. And then you can just dot in to get the text data out and then process that afterwards. But as I said, HTTP command is a class. So you might actually want to just directly create an instance of the class. Turns out you can do this directly with salt without having to load uh, the class into your workspace first. And then for example, you can add header information if you need to authenticate or you know, say you're doing the same uh, request a lot or slightly modified, then you might want to do that using an instance of the HTTP command class. Or if you're really just interested in a one-shot, let's get this thing, and you're not planning to use, you know, more and more HTTP requests over and over, uh, then you could do an expression like this, where you define the instance of class, then dot into that for the do method and get from the URL and then dot straight into the data there. And then you don't have, you know, a leftover uh, copy of the HTTP command class to get rid of and you don't have uh, a lingering instance either. So you might find that, that fairly neat. 
So HTTP command is excellent for bringing in text data. Uh, there's also a get JSON method, which will, you know, get the raw text JSON from the internet, but then return a JSON object. So for typical web application type stuff, it's very, very useful. But you might be wanting to get something a bit more raw, um, do something a bit more custom. And what a lot of people might not know is curl or CURL uh, is actually a bit cross-platform, especially I think at least from Windows 10. You can get it on Windows, Mac OS, you're pretty likely to have it already installed. Like, I don't think you need to install it separately. And it comes with almost, probably comes with every Linux distro. I don't know if there are some hardcore ones that, that don't, but most, you know, most major Linux distributions will have curl. So that means even if you are just going to quad sh out um, and that works, you know, even in Windows, it's just a, a cover of quad cmd in that case or on Mac and Linux, use the default shell and you can get the sort of raw data into the workspace. Now, if that is text data, you can go ahead and convert that yourself. But, you know, perhaps it's more likely that you're getting some other specific type of file, um, in which case you don't need to bring it in, for example, using HTTP command and then write that using quad input or something like this. You could do that directly using curl uh, with the minus O uh, flag there. Uh, minus capital L is just saying, I think, if the request returns that the resource has been moved to a different URL, but it still exists, then it will just do the request again uh, on that other URL. So it's just more likely that you'll actually get the data, even if it was moved at some point. So you might want to bring that uh, onto your file system, then do your processing, whatever that may be, and then delete that afterwards. Um, one example of that is what's used in GET, and that's to fetch a zip file from the internet. Then unpack that and define the stuff. So in particular, you know, define possibly an actual directory or maybe a temporary directory. Then here's the only bit where you have to uh, care about what platform you're on. Because if you're on Windows, the a solution for unzipping zip files that comes out of the box is, weirdly, the tar command. Um, <clears throat> and then if you're on other platforms, then it's unzip, which makes sense for a zip file. Don't ask me why Windows uses tar for unzipping zip files, even though you're more likely to get a actual tar file on Linux. Yeah, it's confusing, I know, but uh, <laughs> this is how it is. And then, you know, processing the contents of that get, for example, will uh, fix the source files into your workspace and then get rid of the zip file potentially. Uh, I sort of alluded to the idea of creating a temporary directory. Just want to shout out that there is a iBeam for this exact purpose. Uh, 739 iBeam, create a temporary directory. Um, but, you know, just a usual reminder that if you're using iBeams, you should really assign them to a name or wrap them in a cover function uh, because they're not guaranteed to have identical behavior between versions of dialog. Um, or necessarily to even remain you know, in the next version of dialogue, for example. So you want to protect yourself so that you could you know, rewrite this if you had to and not have to change all the instances where you've written the, the raw I-beam out. Okay, so yeah, so you've brought your zip file in and you've unpacked it and it contains APL text source files, uh, link definitely subject of, of more tutorials and videos in the future, uh, but for the API function, 
here's the basic syntax. So it's two character vectors. Um, I think you can give an uh, options namespace on the left if you look in the documentation. But basically your first character vector is a namespace path of the namespace that you want to bring the source into as. Uh, and the second one is the directory of the actual source. And import is just one way, it's just getting the code to find into the workspace from the source. I also have mentioned a couple of times now quad fix. Uh, here's how you use that programmatically. So you can define the source of a function as a nested vector of character vectors. So in this case, it's a traditional function with no arguments, it returns no results, and it's called foo. And it has one line, and that is bar, which would be a, an error unless bar is defined. Um, but yeah, you just call two quad fix. And you'll have foo. Uh, the result is this. Uh, character vector you can check but the side effect is to define define the name in the workspace uh, possibly more common use to quad fix is to provide a file path to an APL source file um, this can be the ones with dot APL something like link uses or they can be dot dialog files uh, including functions or scripted namespaces and you'll also get um, that if you modify the APL code on the APL side when you close the editor those changes are automatically updated in the file if you change the contents of the file the next time you open the editor in dialog you'll be met with a prompt asking whether you want to continue with what was defined at that time in the workspace or if you want to update that with the changes from the external source file. So that's like a pre-link method of, of doing that sort of thing, but it's still useful for some things. You might have code that, that needs this. Comma separated values, not to spend loads of time on. I mean, it's something that people use quite a lot because it's a very common file format, I think. Uh, but maybe you don't know the syntax that well just to briefly go over it it's um, up to four element vector argument um, where you can leave out the trailing ones because they have these defaults not these defaults but they have some defaults and basically the first is your actual source of the data and that can be um, data in the workspace or a path to a file. Then you've got something which is the description of the source, uh, which I'll mention what the difference is and why this one's Zilda in a second. Then you've got some numeric code of which four is my favorite. And then the end I've omitted here, but it's a, a Boolean you know, zero or one, whether you should have a separate uh, header row brought in as a separate uh, separate vector and then the the uh, next rows as the data so in this case you have this default zilda for the description now the default is either the letter n or the letter s like capital n or capital s n for nested uh, s for simple default is to just sort of interpret what's given as the source so if it's a nested vector like this so this is two character vectors then that says you know it's this is the raw csv data we're going to uh, interpret it as two lines two rows and then that comes in as a numeric matrix it's a numeric matrix because of this four which says uh, if an element looks like a number then can i please have it as a number and you can see this is numeric because that's what the tilde in the display form means. But the four says, yeah, if it looks like a number, give me a number. If it looks like a character, 
then just leave it alone as as text. Um, an, al uh, an alternative, if you know it should only be numbers and it should error if there are characters, is the number two. But you can look in the docs for the rest of those. Arguably much more common is, uh, I'd say, this sort of pattern. You provide a simple character vector, which gives a relative uh, file path to a CSV file, in which case it will read that data from the file uh, and bring it in as an array in the workspace. Um, if this is supposed to be a simple text vector of CSV data with embedded new lines, then you need to specify an S where this tilde is. And there are actually lots of different ways that you can use Quad CSV uh, to, to bring in different formats of data that aren't necessarily just plain comma separated values. And Adam made a really excellent a video tutorial about that, um, which I recommend you watching if uh, you, you know, do data processing, bringing text data of different formats into the workspace. You can find that at is.gd forward slash dialogue underscore CSV. Okay, the last couple are about processing uh, data that's already um, in your workspace one way, or the or one way or another, but here we'll just look at a couple of quick examples where you've already got uh, character vectors in your workspace. So XML defines a kind of nested structure where you have these uh, elements defined by opening and closing tags, and those can be nested any which way you want. But uh, Quad XML converts that into this fairly specific uh, matrix. And you basically have these five columns. The first is the depth of your element. Then you have the name of it, if it's tag. Then you have the content. Then you have, we don't have any here, but these can be attributes. Um, so you can put sub space something equals value and then that's an attribute. Uh, for those not familiar but you might know something that's XML-like called HTML. It's not strictly XML um, but it's the same same type of ideas in terms of the, the format. And the last column is a numeric code uh, which is some metadata to do with the type uh, in some sense. But you can look in the documentation to see exactly what those mean. The main benefit of a um, structure like this, as opposed to the raw text, well, the raw text, you'd have to somehow completely write an XML parser yourself. Um, but even if it brought in, you know, something like a name nested namespace structure, to represent the nested structure. Uh, if you wanted to apply some operation at a particular level um, or to the contents of any sub tag, for example, then you'd have to do some kind of traversal, uh, some kind of loopy recursive algorithm to, to traverse that data structure. With this matrix format, for example, you know, you could find the sub tags, you could uppercase this CONT, you know, within this actual matrix, and then run XML again to convert the matrix format back into XML text. So in that way, in an APL sense, it's much more convenient for processing the data. And finally, there's a very popular format for serializing data structures and sending them over the internet. That's JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. Uh, here we have an object, two elements, one called A, or two members, one called Abe, one called Bob. And their values are just these numbers, 
by default, quad JSON brings in a JSON object, which is analogous to a namespace, has the same uh, you know notation for dotting into it. We can use the names use command to list the names inside this JSON object. We can dot into it to get the values. Um, but you know, one thing you can also do is get some analogous matrix structure to the quad XML one using format and uh, sorry, using uh, variant and then it's the variant option format. So that's quote, format, quote, space, quote, M quote. But since format is the principal variant option, um, if you just put quote, M quote, you don't have to, you don't have to put format as well. But yeah, this says to bring in some kind of analogous structure. Uh, JSON doesn't have attributes, so that's missing. Uh, but otherwise it's basically the same, the depth, the name of the element, value, and then some metadata, which you can look up in the documentation. And then uh, lastly, just to complete this part, and uh, because it was sort of mentioned, uh, JSON, plain JSON is a fairly strict format. You have to quote all the member names, things like that. And also you can't have comments and nor can you have, um, so if you comment out this second member, then this becomes a trailing comma. And in regular JSON, you're not allowed trailing commas. So you get, you know, this is invalid JSON, but it is valid JSON five uh, and also valid JavaScript. So you can use variant option dialect and then set that to JSON five. And that's the same format as is used uh, by dialog configuration files, as I mentioned. So, as I said, there's a lot to it. Let's, uh, you know, get the sort of one-stop shop, convenient um, user command interface for just getting stuff into the workspace uh, in a fairly quick and dirty way. But, you know, under the covers, there are these more strictly defined API function system commands, uh, sorry, system functions and API functions that you can use in your applications and you know you can uh, handle the errors correctly and you can be certain of what the behavior should be in that sense but that is all I was covering for today so I will say thank you very much for watching so far I'm gonna have a quick check uh, yep yeah. Um, to see if there's any questions, sorry, before I finish up.